I have a good question. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, let's see what you're doing. Uh, yes, you have a question? Sorry about that. I've been having technical difficulties. That's why I got here early. Uh, my speakers aren't working. Uh, initially, it was, my speaking wasn't working, so y'all couldn't hear me. And then it became where I can, y'all could hear me, but I couldn't hear you. So you had a question, ma'am? Is it Christian? Yeah, it's, it's quick. Um, I was just wondering for the um, midterm. Yes. Are they si similar? Um, do they follow the same pattern as um, the tests? Where if you did the practice test, like some of the questions will show up in the... Yeah, absolutely. I, I usually tell my students about 80% of the points will be from the practice test. Uh, I reserve the right to maybe make, you know, up to 20% entirely new material. But generally speaking, yeah, if you do the practice test enough, you're going to uh, probably see at least 80% of the problems. All right. Yeah, I just wasn't sure if it was the same for the, the midterm. That's all I need to yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. Is. That's why I give you the, the so many chances to do the practice test, because I know in, in the end, you guys are solving a lot more physics problems than you otherwise would. So hopefully that means everybody will do well on the midterm. So I take it everybody can hear me, and it seems like I can hear everyone, so that's a good sign. I want to let you know I, it's not quite time for class. It's 12, uh, 29 right now, so we're a little early. But the main thing I want to let you know is I've been putting up, basically, since I'm teaching th uh, two, one, three times, I've been putting up three lecture videos in each of my 241 classes for each day we meet. I don't expect you to watch all those, obviously. But what it turns out is, you know, sometimes if I'm in your class, I might do a, a derivation or solve a problem. And maybe I did something that confused you and so you didn't understand it. Well, what you want to do is look at the one from a different class and see if that version helped you. And just fast forward to that particular one that you were confused by. Or if if I make actually made some kind of mistake in the calculation and went back and correct, you know, I, I, I make careless errors sometimes when I'm solving physics problems for you guys. If I made something like that, sometimes that really messes a student up. So you can go into another uh, class video, look for that same example, and probably that time it won't be messed up. So that's really what I want you to do. Not only that, towards the end of every one of those videos, sometimes I'll have a student stay after, and they'll ask me questions either from homeworks or practice tests, and those are included in there as well. Uh, of course, that, that means I'll eventually have to take them down because they're on copyrighted material, and I don't want to leave that there uh, for a, a, at risk of getting in trouble. But still, right now, they're there, so you might want to take advantage of it because that can let you see even more problems be solved. Plus, I put videos that, uh, like, I, I'm not solving or I probably won't have time to solve a physics problem where you design a bank curve uh, with friction. Well, I already had a video made of me doing that on YouTube, and I gave you a link to that in your this week's module. And then uh, one class, I think it was my NO5B from last night, uh, they actually did do, I actually did do a, a bank curve with friction, or at least I got them started on it. Uh, so you can use, uh, you can use that uh, video to look for that particular example. Okay. So I, I highly recommend you seeing a lot of examples, especially when you run into a, a dead end, like you don't know how to solve a particular problem. You want to look for a problem that uses those same equations and you don't have to like watch the whole YouTube video. I mean, it, it probably uh, helps when it's just running in the background. Uh, as far as my stats go, but I, I'm not monetizing it, so I don't. I, you know, I have not, not made any money off of it or anything weird like that. Uh, so just fast forward through the examples that you're comfortable with and go to the example that you want, or you can just put it on. You know, they can they allow you to adjust the speed, the rate at which you watch it, watch it, so you can up the speed on it uh, to you know four times the speed, and then when you get to something that you're interested in, hit play, and that'll take it back to the normal rate. Uh, so. Anyways, that's something uh, to consider. I just want you guys to know that's why I'm putting all that extra stuff up there. And uh, I haven't updated the list in, since last week of the titles, but I'll probably be updating those today or tomorrow uh, so you can look for new titles up there as well. Any questions now regarding any of that stuff or anything else? All right. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by solving a problem where we're going to actually design a bank curve. Okay, so we're gonna take a, a car, assume its velocity is V, 
assume the radius of the, of the road curve, in other words, right under the center of the vehicle, uh, the distance from that line that the person's driving along, which is circular, to the center of that circle, that's going to be the radius R. And then I'm going to uh, use that to design an angle theta that the curve can be banked at such that it'll make it through it with zero friction. So ignoring friction means I'm giving a safety factor. And that means uh, if there were actually ice on the road, uh, your friction coefficient would be very, very close to zero. And having the curve banked properly, if you come into that bank uh, going the speed limit, which say, say is 25 miles per hour, if you come into it going 25 miles per hour, then you'll actually stay right on the curve, even though there's uh, no friction. OK, the downside is if you're driving in snow and ice, you're often driving slower than the speed limit. Uh, so your instincts would be going to it at 15. Well, in that case, you're going to slide down <laughs> into the guardrail, uh, which is hopefully there. Otherwise, into the little cliff that goes into the wastewater retention pond that's adjacent to it. So <laughs> hopefully that's not the scenario you're going to go through. But uh, anyways, let's, let's do that. I want to start working with example one. And notice I'm using everything in symbols. And the reason why is when you solve it with symbols, uh, you get an answer to all problems, you know, all problems of that type, all velocities, all angles, theta, all radiuses are, uh, stuff like that, and, and all planets, because I'm going to use the, the G in it as well. So uh, that's always a good go-to. And then I'm going to do some examples where we actually have numbers uh, immediately after it with the, the problem, just so you can get a feel for everything. So let me turn on my document cam. So what I'm going to draw is a car sitting on an incline. So my incline will be like this. I'm going to say that angle is theta. That's a really big angle. I'm trying to make sure that I can write big enough for you guys to see it. There you go. And now I'll put a car up here. Or perhaps a Jeep. <laughs> Like that. OK, so that's the scenario. Uh, the car is coming out at velocity V. And the distance to the center over here is R. OK, so we're assuming we know basically uh, V and I'm going to put an M here. We're really not going to need M, to be honest with you, though, uh, but I'm going to put it there so we can work with it and you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, but we're going to assume we know V, M and R and we're trying to find theta. OK. So this will be example one. And the way I do this is with a free body diagram and everything about me wants to make this axis tilted and you don't want to do that for this problem. So I'm going to make up the positive Y axis. I'm going to make to the left the positive X axis. And then, of course, the negative one goes down and right uh, down to the right. And then I'm also going to draw. The incline back there so you can see it. Notice this is the angle of theta right there. Okay. Now, the reason I need to draw that is because I want to make sure I have my uh, normal vector at the right angle. So if I go 90 degrees from this, hold on a second. I think my mother-in-law has left my refrigerator open. I heard, I heard his buttons. I thought you were. I thought you left the refrigerator open. No, he. She told me to make sure it's out of water. But... No problem. So uh, there's your normal force, and I drew it black because it's not uh, aligned with either the x or y axes yet. The other force acting on it, since we don't have friction, will be the weight, and that's just mg pointing straight down, which is a uh, negative y direction. So I drew it drew it red. Okay. Now, what you got to understand here is that this is a 90 degree angle. So since this is theta, this must be 90 minus theta. 
And then this, which is the bank and the normal force, that makes a 90 degree angle. So this one must be theta again. So that comes in handy. Now I'm going to take, hopefully my purple marker is working again, because this is one of my favorite pens. It looks like I have plenty of ink. Uh, I'm going to draw the normal component in the y direction. So here's the normal force. It points in the positive y direction. And then here's the normal force x component. That also points in the uh, positive direction. This one, since it's actually touching the angle, is Fn cosine theta. And this one, on the other hand, is opposite it, so it's Fn sine theta. So now I have, even though I drew it up top of the screen there, now I have all my forces into the components parallel to the appropriate axes. So now I can actually uh, use Newton's second law. I'm going to apply Newton's second law in the y direction. Summation forces in the y direction equals mass times acceleration in the y direction. But we're not expecting the car to bounce up and down like that. So we're going to say A is zero. And that gives me basically all the forces in the y direction is Fn cosine theta minus mg. That's all the forces. It's actually plus mg, but mg is pointing down, so I wrote a negative. And that's all equal to zero. So from that, I get a neat result that you hadn't seen before. The normal force is equal to mg over the cosine of theta. So that's something that's going to come in handy. I'm going to call that equation one. Now the summation of forces in the x direction equals mass times acceleration. That's the only acceleration, so I'm, I didn't need to subscript it. Uh, what I want to point out, though, is that in order for this car to make this circle, it has to be accelerating this way at AC, which equals V squared over R. Notice that is the positive direction. So I can write, uh, that is the acceleration. So on the right-hand side, I can write positive M times that A right there. So when I do this, I see that the only force acting in the X direction is the normal force uh, component. So it's Fn sine theta is equal to M V squared over R. And that's going to be equation two. So now I'm going to plug one into two. And what I'll get is mg sine theta over cosine theta is equal to mv squared over r. And you can see the m's cancel out, which is good because it would be a bummer if you had to have a different angle for each different model of a car. Uh, so, you know, in this case, that means a Prius or a fully loaded, double loaded back truck uh, can still use the same bank curve. Not only that, we got a wonderful identity sitting right in front of our face. Does anybody recall what sine theta over cosine theta is? Tangent theta. Exactly. So now we have that uh, theta is equal to the tangent inverse of v squared over gr. So that's our expression. Professor, can you zoom in? Yes. I didn't focus, but hopefully you can still read it since uh, it's that close. Is that all you need to see or do I need to show you something else? That's good. OK. All right, now example two, let's actually apply this to a particular problem. So theta is question mark when, in this case, I'm going to say uh, V equals 60 miles per hour, which hopefully you guys remember is 26.8 meters per second. And let's say R equals 50 meters. Okay. 
So that's our question. Well, if I go to calculate it, you can see that theta is equal to the tangent inverse of 26.8 meters per second squared over 9.80 meters per second every second times 50.0 meters. So when I do that, I get 55.697 degrees. Now, obviously this is three fig figs, three sig figs, three sig figs. So these last two digits aren't really necessary. I just carry them in case I needed to use that angle for a subsequent calculation. And I always underline them to keep track. And again, this is not really proper lab procedure that, that propagation of error stuff that I've uh, shown you is the way you're supposed to deal with it with labs, but they still more or less use this when they're doing some homework problems. So I'm trying to make sure I keep my uh, sig figs in, in order for that. Uh, if you wanted to consider a different scenario, for instance, if I said for V equals 60 miles per hour, but R equals 100 meters, just to see uh, how theta is dependent on the radius. When I do that calculation, I get 36.238 degrees. So you can see by reducing or increasing the radius by a factor of two decreased uh, this by a pretty big margin, you know, 36 over 55. So that's roughly what, 11, five over six. So yeah, that's about mm, one six to 16 and two thirds percent. So five times that be 50, about 80%. So this is only 80% of that. So I reduced it 20%. Uh, if you want to try another scenario, you might say, well, what about for V equals 30 miles per hour? Again, three sig figs is what I'm working it with here, but R uh, and R still being 100. You can see the, clearly the V is squared up there, so it should have a much bigger effect. And in fact, when you do that, you get theta equals 10.382 degrees. So you can see the uh, decrease in the spree, speed by a half actually decreases well under a third. So uh, yeah, the speed has a much bigger effect than the radius does, but the radius is important, okay? And, you know, by seeing it this way, you can see obviously why, because tangent, if you look, look at a graph of tangent, the only part we care about for this type problem is this part where it goes from zero to 90 degrees. And you can see the bigger the argument, which is this part right here, the bigger that is, the bigger the angle gets. Well, the bigger that is, uh, that bigness quadruples if you double the speed, or it 16 tuples if you quadruple the speed, it 25 tuples if you quintuple the speed, so on and so forth. Whereas if you double the radius, it only cuts it by a half. So that's a way you can analyze this uh, since so we did it in symbol form. Notice that is not an equation that your book chose to number. So uh, if you have to use that, you're supposed to derive it in your uh, solving of the problem. So let's go on to example three now. So what we just did was a, an example where basically we worked out uh, a banking of a curve. Now what I want to do is uh, do something you probably did as a kid, which is imagine taking a bucket of either sand or water and you probably swung it around over your head and the sand or water didn't spill out. That's an interesting phenomenon. So I'm going to actually explain that phenomenon. I'm going to imagine the bucket going in a circle with a velocity, again, just plain V, and a radius, again, just plain R. And what I want to do is analyze it at that point at the top.
So the way we do this is I draw a free body diagram again. This time I'm gonna draw the positive axis is pointing down. Okay, and that's really the only axis I need. Uh, and in fact, the only forces acting on it are the gravity, which is of course it's weight. And then the force that my arm or a rope or the handle of the bucket, whatever it is, is applying a force F to the bucket. The important thing to remember though, is that the uh, acceleration has got to be downward and it's gotta be equal to V squared over R or else it's not gonna maintain a circle. So if I take the summation of forces in the y direction equals mass times the only acceleration, which I'm just gonna call A, then what I get is F plus mg is equal to mv squared over r. Now, I'm assuming I'm pulling down. That means I'm spinning it so fast that it wants to actually continue off this way. And that's really what it would do if it wasn't for me holding on to it. But the fact that uh, I have to hold it means I'm, I'm, I'm spinning it faster than necessary. If I spin it till, uh, if I spun it at such a high speed or rotated at such a high speed that the force required for me to keep it in the circle was zero, then what would be going on is the weight is exactly equal to the force necessary to keep it going in a circle. And the water, of course, wouldn't move at all. So that's how we solve for what the minimum speed is. So V minimum occurs when F goes to zero. Whoa, I left off some words there, minimum. <laughs> minimum. Got in the middle of the word and just thought I'd already did it, finished the syllable. So the, the velocity minimum, which is what speed it has to actually be going to keep the water from spilling on you, that occurs when F goes to zero. So we can see that in fact, mg equals mv squared over r, which is nice because again, we see that the mass is irrelevant. So it doesn't matter if you do a, a thimble, a shot glass, or a five gallon bucket of water, you still get the same result. And v minimum, just right there too, v min is equal to the square root of g times r. Any questions on that? So let's look at example four, where we're going to do an actual application of that. So example four, left off the E. Example four, uh, let's assume R is equal to about the length of a arm. I'm gonna say that's 60 centimeters. What is V min? Okay. Well, V min, according to this equation, is equal to the square root of 9.80 meters per second every second times 0 0.600 meters. And when you do that, you get 2.4248, if I remember correctly, meters per second. Y'all might want to verify that. Of course, I'm carrying again two extra. This is really the reason I normally care, uh, sometimes carry two extra sig figs instead of just one. Uh, if I carried one extra, that would be five, and you'd think it needed to be rounded to 2.43. So when it ever falls on that, whenever it falls on that bubble there like that, I always make sure I do uh, at least two sig figs so you'll know where it came from. Uh, so yeah, 2.4248 meters per second, which doesn't mean that much to us here in America. So I want to tell you that's about 5.41 miles per hour. That's not too terribly fast, but you know it's it's not that slow either. Uh, 
you might also wonder, well, at that speed, how fast will it actually be? Uh, uh, how much force would you have to apply at the bottom? So example five at V min, how large is F at the bottom? So I'm talking about at the bottom of the motion, you know, down here, in other words. Well, in that case, uh, you're going to have your free body diagram is going to look a little different. Uh, I'm going to call up as the positive direction. And what we're going to have is mg acting down and f acting up and then of course the object's got to accelerate at ac equals v squared over r where v is v min okay so newton's second law gives me f minus mg is equal to m v min squared over r so i can see that f is going to be equal to m g plus uh notice also the the m's uh really well i'll just leave it for that right now uh it doesn't actually cancel out that's why i want to see in here so i want to say m now if i square v min v min was the square root of g over r so this will just be g r here over r which I think you can see now is going to become uh, just plain mg. So this becomes 2mg. So uh, in that case, the mass actually matters. And in fact, you're going to ha have to apply twice as much weight. So if I had a five pound bucket of water, then I would have to hold it up at a rate uh, at a force of 10 pounds. Does that make sense? And that's again at V min. If you're going faster, which you probably almost certainly will because uh, you're scared to get the water on you or the sand on you or to make yourself look like a goober by not succeeding. So you're probably going to go even faster, in which case this is going to go even higher. Any questions on that? All right, now I'm going to try another problem. This is going to be example six. And in this case, I'm going to have a rotation uh, in a horizontal plane as opposed to the vertical plane. In other words, we're closer to like the, uh, the bent curve problem. OK, so what I'm going to do is imagine me or you or someone holding a string up and spinning it over our head with a mass M on the end, okay? So what's gonna happen is notice that swing, that string is actually gonna tilt downward at an angle theta. And in principle, it's gonna follow a flat circle like that. OK, what I want to know is for a given speed V and a given string length R, what is theta? So that's our question. That makes sense to everyone? Seems like this marker is dying now. Oh, yeah, that one is actually good. I just happen to have an extra on deck waiting for me. It's been here for two weeks. I'm so excited to be a part of the game. Put me in, coach. I'm ready to play. So everybody understand the problem? 
think yeah. so. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to put the mass M here. I'm going to do a coordinate system where up is positive. And I'm going to treat to the right as being positive as well, because that's the direction I'm going to have to have a, a centripetal acceleration. I'm actually imagining it at this point right here, just for the record. Okay. What I see is I have a force that's not parallel to either axis acting at an angle theta. Now, here's a fundamental rule from geometry in case you've never had geometry or in case you've forgotten the geometry you learned. But to me, it seemed like perfectly common sense. Imagine this and this, since they're parallel, that they're supposed to, both supposed to represent horizontal, they're rails on a railroad track. And you just threw a broomstick across it. Okay, a long broomstick, a two by four maybe, okay. Uh, these, this angle and this angle are between the tracks, so they're called interior. But they're on alternate sides of the two by four, the broomstick. So they're called alternate interior. And as long as the train tracks are parallel, then alternate interior angles are equal. It also turns out, by the way, that corresponding angles, which would be this one here and this one, these two correspond to each other, those are equal as well. So there's some rules of, of geometry that might help you. Corresponding angles look the same, right? So that angle and that angle are equal because they're corresponding angles. This angle and this angle are equal because they're alternate interior. And in fact, this angle right here and this angle right here are equal because they're called vertical angles because they're across a vertex from one another. So that's just some rules that we use in uh, geometry. I always took them as common sense. I never had a, a geometry course, so don't feel bad if you haven't. Uh, now the forces acting on it are the object's weight, mg, downward. And then we have acting in the positive direction, we have uh, this tension, T, okay? Now that's actually a black vector because it's not parallel to either, either axis. But its components are going to be purple because they're positive. So this component, which you can see is opposite the angle theta, is going to be T sine theta. And this component, which you can see is touching the angle or adjacent to the angle, is T cosine theta. OK? So now we're all good. We just have to realize that this thing has to be accelerating in that positive direction. And AC has got to equal V squared over this radius, R, which I put in quotation marks. It's a really weird way to locate it, but if, if this thing's spinning fast enough, this angle will be really, really small. And the difference between R and R quotation marks will be very, very small. I'm going to solve it that way, but I'm also going to give you the right answer and show you a way that you can deal with it. So let's write the summation of forces in the y direction equals mass times acceleration in the y direction. We're assuming we've got it sped, uh, sped up fast enough that now it's staying in basically the same plane. So it's not oscillating up and down in any appreciable way. That means our acceleration in the vertical direction is going to be zero. And now all I have is T sine theta uh, minus mg is equal to zero, which I'll write as T sine theta equals mg, and I'm going to call that equation one. Now I'm going to do the summation forces in the x direction equals mass times the only acceleration. And in this case, you see it's only one force. It's T cosine theta is equal to m v squared over r in quotation marks. OK, now if you look at the triangle, there's r, there's r in quotation marks, and here's the angle theta. I think you can see that cosine theta 
is equal to R in quotation marks over R. So R cosine theta is really what R quotation marks is, okay? So I'm gonna call this equation two prime because it's not quite correct. Well, it, it is correct. I'll just call it T prime. Uh, if I actually write T cosine theta equals M V squared over R cosine theta, then I'll just call that equation two. And then notice I'm just doing a lot of different equations for a good reason, which you'll see in a second. So cosine theta equals M V squared. I'll put a little thing like that on it and I'll call this two double prime, okay? So this is what we're gonna use is two double prime because this is close to true for theta close to zero, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take equation one and divide it by equation two, double prime. Okay. This is that trick that I did with the fuzzy dice. So if you're uh, one of the people that missed the fuzzy dice problem, you're getting to see the trick again. Uh, it's a way that you usually don't learn from your mathematics instructors, though it is it, certainly one they know of. Uh, there's just caveats to it. Like you can't divide by something that could possibly be zero because you might get an expression that you didn't realize was dividing by zero. That makes absolutely no sense. So uh, that's the danger of doing it. But when I divide them, you see that it's going to get T sine theta over T cosine theta is equal to MG over MV squared over just plain R. Okay. That obviously gives me the T's canceling out, which is why I divided it, but we end up getting tangent theta is equal to, notice the M's cancel out as well, and the R comes on top, so it'll be tangent theta equals GR over V squared, which I think looks pretty familiar to you by now. Okay, so that's how we find the actual angle theta. Uh, professor, I had a question. Yes. Why can't you substitute in like um, mg over sine theta for t and then solve it that way? Uh, you could. This is just another way of doing it. But yeah, any uh, okay. way you find is is fine. Uh, I'm just, and, and that's one of the ways that a math teacher does teach you is they'll say, hey, uh, solve one equation for t, which is what you did, and then plug that into the other equation. Then you only have one variable. So yeah, that's absolutely why. The only reason why I do this division is because a lot of students have never thought of that. And sometimes that's the only way you can solve it. So I just want to make sure y'all have that little uh, tool in your tool belt. Cool. Oh, okay. Thank you. No problem. And that was example six, by the way. Now we'll go to example seven, which is us applying that. So let's say we actually allowed this thing to go at uh, 2.42 meters per second, the 5.41 miles per hour. Then what happens? OK, so this is a, a condition five miles per hour is not that slow. I mean, you certainly can spin it faster than five miles per hour, but it's not that slow. Let's see what happens with the angle. And if the angle isn't that close to zero, we'll, we'll know that it's something fishy with it. OK, so when we do this, we're going to say theta is equal to the inverse tangent of 9.80 meters per second every second times, uh, in this case, I'm going to use 30 centimeters, even though that's, you know, we took this 2.42 from the previous problem just to have a, a velocity use. I'm going to choose basically the diagonal distance across a sheet of paper, which is about 30 centimeters. So I'm going to say 0.300 meters. They'll say, and 
R equals 30.0 centimeters. And I'm gonna divide that ultimately, oh, I did the wrong thing, didn't I? Yeah, 0 0.300 meters goes here. And luckily I have a Fliberty gibbet that fixes everything. <laughs> uh, this of course is gonna be 2.42. And I'm just going to leave it at 2.42 because I just made up the reason to use the speed anyways. Uh, and I've got to remember to square that. When I do this calculation, I'm going to come up with a very specific angle. I think it's 26.5 degrees. I think you were right the first time, Professor, because you put GV squared over R, not GR. Over oh, thank you. Squared. Yeah. What, what, where was I thinking that? Yeah, it was G times R. Thanks. Now I got a double race. I appreciate you catching me on that, though. I don't know where I looked and saw it upside down. Yeah, it looks right everywhere I wrote it. So thanks for catching that again. So this is going to be 0 0.300 meters. And then the velocity, of course, I said was 2.42 uh, meters per second. And that's going to be squared. The main thing you see here is meters per second. Every second is meters per second squared times meters. So that's meters squared per second squared. And then this is meters per second, whole quantity squared. So those units cancel out, which is what you expect. Remember, tangent is the uh, ratio of opposite to adjacent. They should be like meters per meter, which would be no unit. So you do expect this to come out to be uh, a unitless number inside the argument. So when I do do that and I get the calculation back, I get 26.657, if I remember correctly. Yes, 26.657 degrees, carrying two extra sig figs. That five is another reason to do two instead of one extra sig fig, uh, just because again, it's that five, you don't know if it's been rounded or not. Now that we have that, we can see, oh, well, crap, that is not what I would call close to theta equal one. So, or theta equals zero, excuse me. 26.657 uh, is not approximately zero degrees. So likely wrong. Okay. Now, how could you address that? Well, you can address that pretty neatly. Uh, we know if we actually divided divided one by two prime or even two, then we would get tangent theta is equal to uh, gr cosine theta over v squared. That would be the difference, right? So what you can do is you can plug 26.657 degrees in cosine theta, okay? And then Solve for the other theta using that same velocity, right? Now that should bring you to possibly a closer angle because what's going on here is we have a, a more or less a tangent uh, transcendental equation. It's really, this is not one that's easy to solve, right? You can't just write theta equals square root of something or other or theta equals the sine of something or another. I don't see any real easy identities that'll fix that. So what you can do is you do that and then solve for that theta, okay? And then you plug this back in here and do it again. And ideally it should go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth where it's narrowing down. And you keep doing that until keep repeating until second decimal place is 
is uh, stable. So that's one way you could do this. It's an iterative method, if you will. If you find that they're going back and forth and getting further and further away from some common center, then it's not the kind of thing that can be solved that way. So that's one way you can get extra credit or half of the way you can get extra credit. So if you do this process, notice you, you solved for theta using it without cosine. You got an angle. Now you're gonna plug in cosine of that angle instead of just one and solve for a new theta. And then you're gonna plug that in there and solve for a new theta. And you keep doing that. Hopefully it's gonna converge on a, on a answer. If it doesn't show me at least five or six iterations. You got to show at least five or six iterations to get extra credit. And hopefully by five or six iterations, uh, you'll have decided that it is converging and you'll have uh, actually this digit right here stabilized. Meaning only this last digit changing. If not, by five or six iterations, you should see it going crazily further and further away from each other. And then that just happens to be one where you can't use this method. The other thing I want you to do for extra credit is plot. tangent theta and that's y equals tangent theta and y equals uh, g r cosine theta over v squared. Uh, I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. G r cosine theta on Desmos. And find an answer that way. OK, wherever those two graphs cross each other, you will have the right theta. OK, and it should look like what you got on there. So if you do these ex these two things here, uh, my syllabus, I think, says I'm going to drop your two lowest uh, regular homework grades. This will make it where you'll now drop. I'll drop the three lowest homework grades. OK, um, Professor, I had a question about yes. Uh, yes. that. If you know that r cosine theta equals the r with the uh, quotation marks. Mm -hmm. Could you substitute um, into the equation, um, like plug in r r and question r and quotation marks over cosine theta um, in for r, and then uh, find theta that way. Like find yeah, that equation. More or less, what you did in way. this first step by taking this and plugging in cosine, and then. Uh, filling all this out, you're actually saying, okay, well, I think the R is closer to this quantity. Okay. And then you're solving for a new theta. Now, if you re repeat that over and over again, you're getting closer and closer each time, ideally. So that, that's why I'm doing it. But yeah, you're exactly doing, thinking the right way. Uh, you, it, you just, uh, I think it was sort of a eureka moment that you didn't realize was a eureka moment where you got what I was doing. <laughs> Does that make sense? I think so. Cause yeah, what I, what I did is I just, uh, I just solved for theta once I did that for just an equation of theta. What did you get for that second theta then? Uh, well, first of all, I did the first, I got the theta with the regular R um, mm -hmm. by doing substitution. So I had to like uh, uh, inverse cotangent of V squared over RG. Mm -hmm. So then I substituted and I ended up with inverse cosecant of uh, V squared over the R and quotation marks G for theta. Okay, so you, did you get another another degree angle other than 26.5? Uh, uh, I need 5. to plug it in, let me see. I'm just going to get something for someone to try. Uh, I'll, I'll actually do it myself, too, just to make sure. So I'm going to say uh, 0 0.30 times cosine 26.657. And now I'm going to multiply oh, that sure. by G. And then I'm going to divide that by V squared, which is 2.42 squared. And now I'm going to take the inverse tangent of that. And I get 24.16. Let me let me solve uh, this one out. I what were the numbers again? Because they're kind of small. I can't really 
tell. So the R is 0.30. Okay. Uh, v is 2.42. All right. Let me start. That. And I got the 26.652. So doing all that, uh, 657, sorry. Doing all that, I got my second value of 24.1636 degrees, which again has uh, three extra sig figs in this case. Now what I'll do is plug that back in and treat that as R again, solve for another theta, and hopefully that one will be closer to the right answer. And hopefully they'll converge. They might even bounce up and down on each side of the right answer. But the main thing is you're looking for this uh, digit in the second decimal place to get stable. Once that becomes okay. stable, then you know you can properly get the answer with the proper rounding. That's why I did one extra digit. So, all right, that's it. Uh, that's it regarding that. So that's a way to handle transcendental equations. That's something that comes in handy from time to time, but it's something that also we can very rarely teach sp specifically because it's hard to just absolutely come up with one of those. So that's uh, whenever I find one, I try to get my students to try it. Now for uh, another iteration, we have might- a question, Rob. Go ahead. What's that? So these, uh, these equations you made today that we learned, are these only apply when the acceleration is constant? Uh, yeah, so if you're in a curve and you decide to hit the accelerator, which a lot of advanced driving courses will tell you, sometimes that's a better thing. Uh, you got to have all the right conditions, the right uh, front wheel drive versus rear wheel drive. I think rear wheel drive is the one that works, but front wheel not so much. Uh, the right friction and that sort of thing. Sometimes they'll tell you to speed up. If that's the case, if you're speeding up or you're hitting the brakes, then yeah, that doesn't apply to this. But if you're trying to go in a circular motion and maintain a constant velocity, a uh, constant speed, then yeah, this equation works absolutely. Fantastic, thank you. No problem. All right, let's look at another example. What I wanna do is use that same equation and figure out how big the velocity has to be to only be uh, five degrees and 10 degrees. So how big or how fast must it travel to only sag by five degrees. And let's call that 5.00 degrees. And then that'll be part A and then part B by one degree, 1 1.00 degree, sorry. So that's just something you can throw in, do the calculation. Uh, you end up getting uh, V is equal to uh, using again that equation. Now we're talking one and five degrees. So this equation is gonna actually work pretty well. I'm gonna have the square root of GR over tangent theta to plug in. And what we'll get for part A is we'll get that the velocity has to be about 5.7969. meters per second, which is, by the way, about 13 miles per hour. And for part B, when I did that uh, square root GR over tangent theta, where this is one degree, this one was five degrees. In this case, I got 12.978. Meters per second which is on the order of 29.0 MPH. So you can see getting it down to one degree, I have to go 30 miles per hour, basically. That's a, that's a pretty big jump. And that's because uh, you're basically trying to use a horizontal component to lift something vertically. So in order to do that, you're actually gonna have to reach an infinite speed. Uh, and of course, that's not just not going to happen. <laughs> the other way of looking at it, notice this. If you want theta to be zero, V has to go to infinity. You don't have to go to infinity as much as if it was just plain V, but the fact that it's V squared it helps you a little bit. But still, you, you get closer and closer to infinity to get that closer and closer to zero. Any question on that? Okay, 
So we started at what, 1230? We're supposed to run to 145. Yeah. No questions on that, everybody? I'm worried my speaker stopped working yet. So that's example eight, and that sort of uh, exhausts those possibilities. Uh, what else would I like to do? That uh, basically is enough to complete really chapter uh, chapter five, but I'm gonna go ahead and do one more robust example. And this one, I'm gonna try to include friction. So we're gonna do the same uh, car scenario. And I'm going to assume that the car might be going close to the maximum speed so that the friction force acts to push, push the car down. So here's my angle theta. We can't see it. Oh, thank you. There's my angle theta. There's my car. Okay. It has a mass M, which may or may not be relevant. It's still going a velocity V and the radius is still R. I draw my free body diagram this time though. Uh, again, I use a vertical Y component and I'm assuming it's uh, going around a curve this way. So I'm gonna call this the positive X direction. So the forces acting on it are MG downward which is already along the coordinate direction, so I can draw it red. Uh, then I have this angle, this incline angle at theta. So in this case, I actually have a normal force perpendicular to that. Ah, that was my dead marker, I think. And I also have a friction force, which is going to uh, act along this direction. And that's going to be a static friction because I'm assuming they're not skidding yet. Okay. Now, in reality, when we're done with this, we need to check what happens, uh, what minimum speed requires a friction force to push that way, uh, just to keep from sliding down the hill, for instance. Let me double check something real quick. Yeah, we'll look at it. Okay, so now all I gotta do is uh, make my components. Obviously I've got uh, two vertical or two positive components for the normal force. And of course, what we found earlier was this is 90 minus theta. So this has to be theta which means this one has to be theta in this case. So this is Fn cosine theta, and this is Fn sine theta. And this is mu static times Fn. In other words, I'm considering the maximum case right now because that really is a scenario. We want to go as fast as we can without sliding up the hill. So, the static friction is going to apply just enough force until it can't do any more, and it can't do any more when it gets to this amount. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, this yep. one's going to have a negative y component. So that should be mu sub s fn times the cosine theta. Oh, excuse me, times the sine of theta. I was reading that angle as it's up here, but it's actually down at the bottom, remember. So this is the angle theta. So this is Fn sine theta. This, on the other hand, is a positive component going to the left. So it actually contributes to the centripetal acceleration force. So in this case, it's mu s Fn times the cosine theta. So now we're in a position where we can write our uh, Newton's second law. So the summation forces in the y direction equals mass times acceleration in the y direction, which again, we're going to say the y direction acceleration is zero. So in this case, I'm going to get all my positive forces, which is Fn cosine theta. Uh, and that's the only positive one. 
and then I get minus mu S N F normal sine theta, and then minus M G, all that equals zero. So I can factor out an Fn and say the Fn times cosine theta minus mu S sine theta is equal to Mg. In other words, I pulled the Mg over here first, by the way. Okay. So you can see the F normal is now going to be equal to Mg over cosine theta minus mu sub S sine theta. That's going to be equation one for us. So that Newton's second law in the y direction gave us some good valuable stuff there. Now Newton's second law in the x direction. Now we got to remember this thing's got to accelerate in the positive direction. Like that. So now I'm going to take all my positive forces in the x direction, which is only this guy and this guy. So I want to say Fn sine theta plus mu S Fn cosine theta is equal to mv squared over r. That's going to be equation two. Now I'm going to plug one into two. So I'm going to get mg. And notice there's an fn in both terms. So I'm going to go ahead and get a common denominator too. Uh, that common denominator, of course, is already there. It's cosine theta minus mu s sine theta. That's already there. So now I'm going to get fn. This gave me an mg times a sine theta. This one gave me uh, a mu s an mg sine theta and a cosine or excuse me an mg and a cosine theta so this one will be plus mu s mg cosine theta that's all equal to mv squared over r I can now factor out an mg. So I'll say mg times sine theta plus mu s cosine theta over cosine theta minus mu s sine theta is equal to mv squared over r. And you can see, again, mass is not relevant, which is nice. Uh, of course, solving for theta, that's that's just a nightmare, okay? But you have an expression that allows you to come really close if you so desire. You just have to calculate sine theta minus mu s cosine theta over cosine theta minus mu s, or excuse me, this one's supposed to be plus, uh, mu s sine theta. That's equal to V squared over GR instead of that nice tangent expression we had before. So you might think, well, this is horrible. And, and yeah, it is. Uh, you would need to you know, find out what mu s is. And, and to give you some idea, uh, I found mu s is when the street is dry from the Department of Transportation and other publications. Uh, mu s for dry roads and rubber is on the order of 0 0.6 on up to 0 0.85. OK, but in wet conditions, it's on the order of 0 0.2 to 0 0.4. So that's a that's a ballpark figure for you. But you can put that in and you can graph uh, the numerator and over the denominator. You could graph that as a function, like I said, with Desmos and then put in your v, y equals V squared over GR and put that in Desmos and you know, basically find where those two lines cross and that would actually give it to you. 
Uh, that again is another nice way of solving a transcendental equation. Or you could flip it. And what I mean by flip it is say, okay, well, how about this? How about I calculate all this for a bunch of different angles and see what velocity they correspond to? So that's just another way to work around it. We can just say, okay, well, screw it. Let's take five degrees, 10 degrees, 15 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees, 40 degrees, and see what you know velocities I get that this works for. Again, using say the minimum for dry concrete or dry asphalt or whatever, and the minimum for wet, you can get a table of values uh, of velocities that are reasonable, okay? So that's it. That's uh, basically the last part of this chapter that I think everybody should be able to do. Uh, oh, really? I actually, I completely forgot about the about the uh, air resistance. The general rule, by the way, with air resistance, I would just quickly tell you this: uh, the air drag or air resistance. This is example nine. Air drag. is a force that's either proportional to velocity or velocity squared, okay? We're only handling the velocity one. Uh, the, the velocity square, squared one's a little bit more complicated, but if you just take a ball falling, for instance, then the uh, forces acting on it are mg and can't see it. Oh, thank you. The forces acting on it are mg and some constant bv. As the velocity gets higher and higher and higher, clearly the drag force gets larger and larger and larger. So from that, you can say, well, mg minus bv is equal to m dv dt. You can divide both sides by M, you'll get G minus V over G V is equal to DV DT. Okay, now you can say DV over G, or excuse me, over, yeah, over G minus B over G V is equal to DT and we can integrate from t equals zero to some t. Okay. Well, we can say let, uh, let u equal g minus b over g v, then du is equal to negative b over g dv. So really all I need is a negative b g in front of my dv to make it a du. So I'm going to say negative G over B times the integral of DU over U is equal to T minus zero. Because that side's just the integral of T minus zero. Of course, the integral of DU over U is just ln. So I'm going to get negative G over B ln G minus B over G V of T evaluated from t equals zero to t, and that's just equal to t. I can take that and uh, write it this way. I'm gonna say ln of g minus b over g v of t, evaluated t equals zero and t, is equal to negative b over g times t, and now I raise the left-hand side, or e to the left-hand side's power, and raise the e to the right-hand side power, and set them equal to each other, which would make a mathematician scream. But anyways, that's what we're going to do. Okay. When we do that, of course, this becomes, this whole thing in here becomes, because the subtraction of lens is the lens of the division. So uh, the first one is going to be that. So it'll be G minus B over G V of T minus ln of this, which is actually going to be just divided by ln of the division of this. So this is going to be, in fact, G minus B over G times V zero. 
So ultimately what I'll get now raising e to the limit of that power just gives me g minus b over g v of t divided by g over b over g v zero is equal to e to the negative b over g t. And you can solve for v of t at this point. And you'll have an expression for the velocity as a function of time. And then you could, of course, go on. What you're going to see is it basically asymptotically approaches some critical speed. And that critical speed is basically the speed at which uh, b times v is equal to mg. So max speed occurs when mg is equal to bv. And that's what you'll see. Uh, we're about out of time and I'm about out of paper. Uh, let me go ahead and try to do this for you real quick. I'm going to say, sorry about this. I'm going to jump over to over here so I don't waste another sheet of paper. But basically, I'm going to say G minus B over G times V of T. That's the function I'm trying to solve for is equal to g minus b over g v zero all that times e to the negative b over g times t now i can pull this over here and this over here and i'll get g minus g times e to the negative b over g t and then uh minus a plus it becomes plus uh, B over G V zero E to the dot, dot, dot. And on the other side, it's going to be equal to just B over G V of T. So ultimately, I should be able to write V of T is equal to, I'm going to have a G over B out front. And now I'm going to have all this stuff, which you can see, uh, is kind of ugly, but it's G minus G E to the negative B over G T plus B over G V zero E to the negative B over G T stuff like that. And that's actually the expression. You can simplify it a lot more, but it's, you know, it's not that useful. The main thing is I wanted you to see that this is just a simple application of differential equations. In fact, probably your first week of differential equations, if not your second, uh, you'll solve exactly this problem in a differential equations class. Uh, we did. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah, y'all did that too. Yeah, if you've had the differential equations already, that should be pretty straightforward. But anyways, I just want to show you that it is something we can do. Uh, most of the stuff we solve in physics and engineering nowadays, we do with computers, uh, which a lot of people think we've lost some insight. And we probably have. We're not as good at, at solving differential equations by hand anymore. Uh, but we still have those methods. We can always look them up and, and then apply them. But by using computers, we also have allowed us to solve a lot more problems that we couldn't have solved in the, uh, to begin with. So in that sense, I think it's even better. Uh, so that's the way you'd really solve a, a one that has a, a drag force proportional to b squared. Or if you were doing it in two dimensions, you're going to have a drag force that never decreases or never comes to a maximum horizontally because there's you know there's no way you're going to have a force continuing to act horizontally. So the more it speeds up, the bigger this force is going to get horizontally. But vertically, you're still going to have this terminal velocity that occurs uh, basically at velocity equals mg over b. OK, that's it. You guys are free to go. The time is up. It's uh, 141. Class is supposed to be over at 145. So you're good to go. I have posted videos of everything we've done so far. Hopefully, this video will go up tonight. If not, it'll be up first thing tomorrow. Uh, Professor, can you show the extra credit problem one more time? Yes. I just wanted to see the uh, what what you wanted us to graph on Desmos. So I'm I got to, the the value that it converges to. Yeah, I want you to uh, graph y equals tangent theta. Okay. And then I want you to take the g, the r, and the v that I gave you, and plot g r cosine theta over v squared. 
Both of those. And just be clear, R was 0.3 and V was 2.42, right? Exactly. Okay. And that should come up to what your uh, your theta converges to. And you say you did get it to converge, so that, that's good. That means uh, yeah. I was. I did, right. but when I'm graphing it, it's not doing, it's not converging to the place that I, it's not crossing at the place that I thought it, that I uh, said it converged to. I uh, gotcha. Uh, well, it, check yeah, it's your converging like check one, your one point over. Here. Gotcha. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and let you guys go. If anybody has any Thank questions, you. stick around and Thank ask. You Otherwise, sir. you're free to go. I don't know if you've seen these pens, the the erasable ones, the uh -huh. pen, um, but they're awesome. I know you use a lot of whiteout. Yeah. So, who's this? One? Who's it by? Uh, it is on um, Pilot. It's Pilot. a. Yeah, friction ball. I can email you the link to the Amazon if you'd want. Cool. Yeah, I, the last time I used the erasable pen, I wasn't impressed with it. But if this one, if you're using it, then it probably works pretty well. It's something to try. Yeah, no, I like it erases cleaner than pencil. Like oh, nice. you, it, it's pretty cool. I'll, I'll send you the link. I love this marker or this pen, these precise V5 pens. They, they're wonderful writing. And uh, these toll pens are super expensive and nice, but they run out of ink too quick. But they don't have a raceable either one. But yeah, I would like to uh, check it out. So yeah, send me a link to it from Amazon. That'd be cool. Yeah, like they don't like write as clean as like a regular ballpoint does. They write plenty clean enough, but like it's not like a super high end writing. But the racing is really good. Nice. Yeah. Thanks, David. Have a good one. You too.